Well, 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 a warm hello to all of you out there. And may I say at the outset how deeply honored I am to introduce a film called Too Good to Be True that pays tribute to two of the finest airplanes the skies of this country, indeed this planet, have ever known, the Jetliner and the Arrow. And to the Canadian workers who manufactured them at Avro Aircraft Limited, located in Malton, Ontario, a company where I am especially proud to say that starting in 1953, I spent six of the most exciting years of my life. The heroes of this film are many, among them the chief engineer Jim Floyd and his remarkable team of men and women who designed and built both of these aircraft, and Don Rogers and Jan Zurakowski who flight tested them. But I must clarify something before proceeding any further. I was not a flyer at Avro, nor did I ever hammer so much as a rivet into the paneling of either aircraft, nor was I an engineer or a technician of any kind, although the employment wing of the personnel department sent me to Great Britain a couple of times in 57 and 58 with an aeronautical engineer on extensive hiring missions. No, my specialty was counseling employees at Avro who required help on personal problems of an infinite variety that were having a negative effect on their work performance. Avro, Avro. Let me tell you, I'll never forget those years at Avro Aircraft because those were the years the Arrow was built. And although more than 35 years have since passed, that aircraft, in a number of key respects, is still ahead of anything that flies today. I wasn't on hand for the jetliner when Jim Floyd and his team brought it on the scene during the immediate post-war two years, but I saw it and stood inside it and heard about it from the engineers who built it and admired it. However, having expressed such positive sentiments, let me just add that other emotions stir within my memory that have little to do with honor or pride. I'm talking about the sudden, ruthless, arrogant, and ultimately ignorant way in which the government of the day, and certain politicians in particular, clipped the wings of the arrow, canceled its contract, killed it, and destroyed in a single blow this country's supremacy in the air. The documentary that follows does not stint, I assure you, in its coverage and condemnation of this unholy tragedy that need never and should never have been, but a colossal example of sellout and of the horrors wrought by bias, extremism, and personal hatred in party politics. Nor does this documentary ignore what had happened earlier to the jetliner. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let the movie makers tell it in the way it should be told. Here, in the, his own words, the chief engineer himself, Jim Floyd, too good to be true. One was the world's greatest passenger jet. The other was the world's greatest fighter jet. Both were created in Canada by the same man. Both met the same fate. Jetliner was the first commercial jet transport to fly in North America. It was safe, reliable, easy to fly, and fast. It was. Its creator was an engineer named Jim Floyd. The thing about the Jetliner was that it was the first aircraft on which I had the full responsibility for the design. And uh, so the buck stopped here for the first time in my life, and this made it a very special airplane to me. And also, I had a crew on the jetliner, really, they were just like a, a big family, a bunch of friends, and they were pushing as hard as they could to make this aircraft the thing that would put Kennard on the map. They began work on the plane that would open the jet age in the spring of 1946, for Jim Floyd and his team of young engineers, it was the project of a lifetime. Three years later, the prototype was ready to be tested on the ground. 
The conditions were absolutely hopeless. The Department of Transport had decided to tear up the runways uh, for some major rework, and they just left us one very much too short uh, runway uh, on which to try this hot aeroplane out. And every time that Jimmy would go down trying to get the aircraft up to takeoff speed on a high-speed taxi run, he'd have to slam on the brakes and the brakes would get hot and the tires would blow. And we went through thousands of tires and then on the 10th of August, 1949, we held a conference and uh, Jimmy said, I can't go on like this any longer. He said, next time I take her down the wrong way, I'm gonna take her off. And that's exactly what he did. The pilot was Jimmy Orrell. But the man who flew the jetliner the most was his co-pilot, Don Rogers. The jetliner was really a remarkable experience from my point of view, being the first jet transport that I'd flown. Uh, the performance was outstanding, the acceleration and the initial climb, and the surprising part of it was how quiet it was, because with the jet engines, uh, we were able to talk to each other uh, without using headphones, just in normal tone of voice. The response of the aircraft and the controls and everything went so well. Trouble was, the jetliner's original customer got cold feet and backed out. Trans-Canada Airlines, the forerunner of Air Canada, decided that it could make do with its propeller planes instead. So Abro took the plane to the United States in search of new backers. The first flight we did was from Toronto to New York. And when we uh, arrived down there, in about half the time of any other scheduled airline, I was absolutely staggered at, uh, at the scene down there because the New Yorkers had, got, had heard of this airplane coming down. And uh, they were stacked about four or five deep around the perimeter of the airfield. The news people were there with all the cameras and so on and so forth. And we could hardly get out of the airplane. Then we were escorted into the city, into the hotel, with a police escort on motorcycles going through all the stoplights and just uh, being taken rapidly into the hotel. And this was quite a, an outstanding experience for a young fellow like me from Dundas, Ontario. In Boston, Chicago, Miami, the jetliner was a sensation. It was still the age of the propeller plane, the DC-3. The jetliner flew twice as high and three times as fast. For most people, it looked like something out of science fiction. Wherever the jetliner went, it created a tremendous amount of interest and also some consternation because the air traffic controllers were having a real problem with the jetliner. Don Rogers would report his position at 35,000 feet and 450 miles an hour, and the air traffic controller would come back and say, you mean 3,500 feet, and uh, check your speed again. Uh, you, that can't be right. They just weren't used to these uh, speeds and altitudes at that time. Also, the airport managers were having problems with the jetliner. They thought it would burn up runways and destroy the terminal buildings, this fire-spitting monster. And in one case, there was a guy with a long stick holding a kerosene-soaked rag right into the jet pipes to see if they'd set on fire, and they didn't. So the jetliner finally became accepted as a normal airplane on the ground, despite the fact that it was such a phenomenal airplane in the air. Canadian Minister of Defence Production, C.D. Howe, wanted fighter jets for the Korean War. Howe wanted Avro to stop all work on the jetliner until they'd met his production quotas. The delay threatened to last for years. 